Hey guys, welcome to Better Body Radio, Meet the Coaches series. So today we are joined by Mark Doherty and Ema Louise Morrison. I don't know if you say the, the middle name normally or not, or whether you just do the Ema Morrison part, but either way, it works. Um, so guys, just so you know, we're doing just a little bit of an initial series just before we get into the, the main, I suppose, meat of the podcast, the main Better Body Radio show, bringing on our, our different experts and guests, just so you guys can get to know each of our coaching team that little bit better, understand uh, what got them into the fitness industry, uh, what motivates them as coaches, and what it is they're trying to, to do in order to help as many people as possible. So uh, guys, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. So before we get um, get you into just talking a little bit about your own stories, I thought it would be good for, because you guys obviously moved here to Dubai uh, a number of years back, so my first question would actually just be, um, how did you both meet, and when did you make the plunge to kind of move over to Dubai? So it basically started, um, we were in a gym, obviously, and Emer was on a Stairmaster, and I seen her staring over at me and eyeing me up. So I approached her, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> six, months, six months after we, we met, we then we came to um, Dubai. We just wanted a, a different life and something different and new. Um, and and we, had, we knew someone here. So we, we decided this would be the place to come. And this was near, um, five, over five years ago now, almost five and a half yeah. years now. So I'm going to guess if I ask Ema her first, uh, her side of the story for the first part, it's not going to be the same as yours. No. 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 <laughs> Mark said, he came up to me and said, if you need any help on nutrition, here's my number. That sounds familiar. That's the line he always uses. I went for a nutrition <laughs> plan and then the rest was history. So... Uh. <laughs> I have to say that I do like Mark's version. Yeah. Definitely the guy version, for sure. Awesome. Cool. So um, I guess each of these questions that we were going to run these at you guys is going to be, I'll ask the question and I'll start, of course, ladies first. That's the, the polite thing to do. And then we'll switch it over and we'll just flip back and forth between the two of you and <clears throat> get an answer for each question. So the first one is, um, how did you get started in the fitness industry? And... Can I, at what point did you realize along the way that, you know what, this is actually the kind of career path that I want to be doing? Because, you know, it's like often a lot of people, they get into the industry initially because they maybe just they enjoy fitness, they enjoy training, but they haven't really maybe thought about it as yet as a, as a career. So what got you started and what made you realize this is actually something I want to continue doing? Uh, Mark? For me, it started way back in like 2008. I moved away and I gained a lot of weight through bad eating habits, kind of comfort eating and stress. So then I joined the gym in Dublin to try and get the weight off. And then when I came back to my hometown, um, I met Mark. My initial background was management. I managed like coffee shops and restaurants and I kind of fell in love with fitness. And Mark kind of seen something in me I didn't see in myself. So I ended up quitting my management job and going um, kind of head first into the personal training. And I haven't looked back ever since. So I got all my qualifications and then we moved to Dubai together. So my passion um, is female fat loss. Because I've been there myself, I know how they feel and I'm more empathetic towards my clients and their background and why they do what they do because I've been there myself. So my passion is to help them kind of have a better relationship with food and kind of get their confidence um, to kind of go out and do it by themselves when our time is over together um, between that personal training relationship. Very nice. Good. I think that's a, as good a reason as any. I think a lot of people can often resonate with a coach a lot better when they've actually been there themselves and they kind of understand everything you've, you've been through, right? So Mark, I'll flip that right back at you. Uh, I can understand your origin story goes back just a little bit further. Yeah, it's um, a little, just a teeny little thing. <laughs> um, so my father put me in a gym at the age of 15 years of age and I became absolutely hooked on training and nutrition, specifically so for nutrition. I, I basically geeked out on nutrition and after, with, at the time I was 17, I knew like so, so much. Um, then I was studying my A-levels and I actually made a flop on my A-levels because um, I was doing so much study on nutrition. So I ended up doing a HND and then continuing as a personal trainer. 
and continue to get as many qualifications as they can, nutritional qualifications, to the point where I did body type nutrition a long, long time ago, and I became an online coach for them and an educator. So they used to have um, a nutrition cor course, and 100 students used to come on. I used to teach as part of a contest prep, uh, peak week, and the science between fat loss supplements. And then that uh, back then was um, when I was working a lot online. That was my first time online as well as personal training. Um, so I have a lot of experience online. Um, and yeah, I just have a passion for nutrition. That's what I do. Um, I have so much experience working with people. I've worked with every type of clientele from contest prep to elite athletes to general population, fat loss, even general population health. Um, my passion is helping general population. I've really gone in the direction where like diabetes, obesity, uh, people with issues around food, um, to the point I'm, I'm doing more qualifications and studying again and go back to university again in September for five more years. And I'm going to do nutritional therapy, which will um, direct me toward that type of clientele. So now 99% of my clientele is general population. Um, yes, fat loss, but health issues. Uh, we have a certain range of scope of who we can practice with. Um, I'm also like I'm a huge fan of referring out and working with all our professionals in the industry, endocrinologists, psychologists, um, because I can't save everybody, unfortunately. I wish I could, um, but I love helping people, uh, and that's just my passion, and I will continue on with that. So that's, this is now like 27 years later, I'm still here doing this job, uh, and I still love it. Brilliant. It's kind of like we um, we talked about this on the live last night, didn't we, as well, like kind of just um, in terms of clients being coachable and everything else. And like you said, you cannot um, help everyone. Um, and despite the fact we're living in an age where we literally have access to the most information we've ever had access to and so easily at just the touch of a fingertip. You, know, you don't even need to get up off the sofa. You can just pull out the phone out of your pocket and you can pretty much find just about anything you want. Now, I think obviously what I think you've done well and what kind of got us sitting down and having a chat initially mark was that it was very clear that you take what because let's be honest as much as there's a lot of information people don't know how to decipher what's good information yeah. and and even if you could decipher what good information is how do you put it into practice in a, in a practical way and um, i think one thing that you have probably done over the last few years that's been at least from since we've kind of come to know each other is you've made nutrition and nutrition behind fat loss for general population very simple to, to, to understand and I think that's yeah. something that we need uh, I don't think there can ever be enough of that in the industry so I think that's something I would definitely commend you for is the kind of where the direction you went with that cool so we're going to switch gears a little bit um, and this will be a bit, I'm very interested to see what the answer is here um, for both of you given that you both you know um, had different lengths of time in the industry you've maybe got um, some similar target clients that you're kind of trying to work with, but you've also got some slightly different clients that you're potentially working with and have worked with as well. What um, what motivates you most as a coach, you are? What motivates me most as a coach? Yeah. What motivates you to kind of keep going and turn up your, your best self and to continue learning and developing? For me, it's, I just like to continue learning on kind of more injuries or different positions that I can put my clients in so they get the most out of each exercise. Mm. So based on their anatomy, that's what I really love and I need to learn more. So this is why I'm continuing to study. So as long as I can develop like a training program that suits them and they get the most out of the workouts, then that's what gives me more passion to keep doing what I'm doing and keep learning. Because there's so much out there since I started um, and there's so many coaches that I follow that I'm kind of learning from them online because I can see their passion resonate. So I want to kind of take that on board and push myself further. Nice. Cool. Mark, what about you? What uh, motivates you after 27 years? I think um, the same for both of us, um, seeing clients' results. When we see clients, we talk a lot about transformations, but... Like for me, when I see clients, for me, what is a transfer, transformation? It's both 
not just physiological improvements in health, but also psychological improvements, better relationship with food. So yeah, it, it hurts me when I see clients do not succeed. Um, but yeah, when I see clients succeeding, then that keeps me driving me. And as Emer says, like, I think when it comes to biomechanics, you flip the switch for her, yeah. which is amazing. And now she's becoming very much elite in that. Um, where I like about our team, we've all got our our specialities, but the, everybody else has to keep up on par with what everybody else's speciality is. Um, so a passion for learning as well is very important. Um, and for me, you have to take like every day as a, as a school day, you're always learning from clients. So when we ask, we, we speak a lot about evidence-based training, evidence-based nutrition, and people think it's just, oh, this is what the concurrent studies say, which is not, it's not just about studies. It's also takes into consideration the experience of the coach and it takes into consideration the preferences of each and every client. There's no one, one size fits all. Um, so yeah, I just like, I love what I do. Some days, obviously it's never going to be perfect. We're going to have some up and down days. Um, but yeah, I'll continue to do it for a long, long time. Awesome. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question that I'm not actually prepared for today. And I think it'd be interesting to hear both your answer on this. Um, it's just related to the thing you just said there, Mark, about we're not always going to have, I think a lot of people look at, you know, a personal trainer's job or a coach's job. And they think, oh, you know, that's a dream job. It's, you know, it just must be so easy to do something that you love. But I think anyone who's been in, had enough skin in the game for long enough kind of understands how uh, it's really not a glamorous industry by any stretch of the imagination. It's long hours. It's hard work. It's a lot of physical and mental energy that you give out to each and every single one of your clients, whether it's in person or online. Um, and then, of course, you have to have the energy to do your own training, sort your own life out, to continue your own education. Um, yeah. How do you, so I'll start with Emer on this, how do you go about, because I think this is something that all coaches have struggled with at some point where, like you said, Mark, clients are going to fail or they're not going to adhere to the plan. So how have you went about improving your ability to become a bit more resilient to um, handling a client's failures? Like, for example, I know that, um, speaking from Mal, um, she went through a long period of time, especially when we first moved out here with all the cultural differences and working with not just, you know, people from Scotland who are Scottish now, but working with every type of nationality under the sun, you know, from different cultures, religions. Uh, and it's easy to take failure to heart as a coach and kind of blame yourself and what, what am I doing wrong and da da da. So I guess the question is, how do you, how have you got better at kind of almost not taking failure so to heart? Um, yeah. How, how have you kind of, where have you been like, like through your career with that and what have you done to kind of try and improve not taking things so so personally? To be honest, I used to take it very personally because <laughs> I, often I was doing wrong. I and think we all did at yeah. one time. We all, uh, we went through a period as a trainer and some things we, we, things kick us in the teeth still. Yeah, to this day, but it's like I've learned not to take it so personally, but I also ask myself the question as in how can I improve next time? Mm. Like, I mean, it's never going to be perfect and you can always do better. The client might have reasons for not complying to the program. So maybe it's asking specific questions or maybe giving them more hours out of your day to try and build that relationship a little bit better. But it's still hard because I do take it personal, but I take it as a way that I can kind of grow as a personal trainer and kind of expand my knowledge even more. Plus Mark uh, calms me down as well, he says, because he's been at it longer, so he knows not to take it as personal as I used to do. So I've got a lot better. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's actually a really interesting thing you said about, you know, um, giving potentially like, you know, I think Phil Lerney, I always used to hear talk about this is, even if it's the client's fault, you've always got to treat it as, well, what can I do better? And that's actually, Part of that book that I recommended to you, Mark, about that extreme ownership, it's like, even if it was literally 100% the client's fault, um, yeah. I think most good coaches will always look and say, right, okay, well, even if it isn't my fault, fault quote unquote, what can I do to um, support my client better in this situation if it ever arises again, or can I provide a different solution? And uh, yes, I think that's key. And then the one thing that I think 
because online coaching has become so glamorous now and uh, people want to step into doing lots and lots of online and like well, I can work with more people in less time. One point you just mentioned there, you know, is that I think most good coaches I'm aware of anyway often are they don't ever sweat giving more of their time if it's genuinely needed for that individual. Like I've done so many assessments with clients where it's meant to be an hour initial assessment and I'm there two hours later because I felt like the client just needed that time. Um, you know, check-ins that have been 25 minutes to half an hour in length because, you know, okay, the last client may only need the five, five minutes. Just like, well, everything's going well, ticking the boxes, cool, crack on. Uh, but someone else is having a complete mental breakdown and going off plan. So I think that's a bit of a lost art in the industry. And I think that's what will help you guys and will help our team stand out is that we're, we're willing to go that kind of extra yeah. length for people. So yeah, Mark, we're, 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 trying the, we're trying the as well as a team. Like, how can we do better is a, is a question. Yes, I always ask. But now we've got a better team. We've got... Um, We've got guys who specialize in different areas. We're making our product better, our online, our online systems. And when I used to work back doing online stuff, we're putting a lot more work into it. But at the same time, it's still the same amount of coaching we give. It's still our one-on-one -on -one coaching. We, it doesn't matter how much product and how fantastic it looks and amazing. As long as we can put, we know we're putting our full focus into an individual client is all we can do. Um, yes, I've made some mistakes throughout the years um, where I wish I had done this and done that. But uh, this is what's made me today who I am. And basically, if I can give my all to a client, I will give what it takes as long as they're putting in the work. We have to get a stage where we ask ourselves, is this client willing to change and, and we have to have that, that um, talk to them sometimes, right? We, we, we got to move forward. Are you ready for this change? Are you not? So I think in this industry, you need to develop a thick skin. Unfortunately, it's, it's pretty much a, a pretty much ego driven industry with so many types of coaches out there. But like, I don't really care what our coaches do. I focus on my clients. I don't care what anybody else says, how I do my work as long as my clients. And I know as well, I, deep down, I know I give my clients so much and my success rate is pretty high. And we, we spoke about this last night. No coach will have 100% success rate. So we got to realize, and, and we have to have self-acceptance to this and say, right, this is it. We can't save everybody. So we'll just put as much work in the people who are willing to change. And that's all we can do. Definitely. I'm going to go on a bit of a side tangent with uh, what you just said there as well, because it, it reminds me, and this is always a, a personal ethical battle that I'm always having with myself is, you know, that always the statement of, well, don't worry about what other people are doing. You just focus on yourself. Yeah. The thing that I struggle with with that though is that because in a way, every personal trainer who's conducting a session in the gym is representing the brand or the industry that is personal training and coaching. And so it does really frustrate me and break my heart when I see people diluting what, should be yeah. like essentially they're, they're giving a portrayal of the industry to be rep counters you know con men scamsters and then you've got people like us who are very genuinely just like we want to help people literally not only transform their physique but you know completely change the way they think and the way they live and their habits so i find it hard and i think it's almost like well on one side don't care from the point of view that they're not going to change how i operate as a coach but i think probably the best way we can um kind of put our mark and shape the industry is to one lead from the front and practice as the best possible version of the coaches we can be but then also mark something that i think we're excited about later down the year is and as a yeah. team like the team grows and develops their expertise and they're able to offer that to other coaches building the education part of our, our business as well and i think that's at least what we could do potentially to give back because as much as i feel like i don't care what other people do i also kind of have to care i kind of want to see that that minimum standard being raised from where it's now. Um, just, just to add to that as well, like I traveled for many years. Oh, I've done so many workshops, seminars. I traveled a lot to like England. I went to America sometimes for seminars, workshops to keep learning. Hmm. And I thought, right, Jesus, I'm spending so much money. I'm going to bring coaches to Ireland and I'm going to set up seminars. So I used to bring Ben Homer at the time. Um, Andy McKenzie, Phil Lerner, I brought them all to do seminars. And what you find is 
the people who turn up for them seminars are the ones with the passion and are the ones who are improving their skills and want to improve it. We're unfortunately always as well going to get people, people finish their level three, um, which I think is a very poor um, level. You need to keep progressing after that. Um, but repeat, these people do not want to invest themselves because they're not passionate trainers who want to change people. They just want to make money. We're always going to get that. But yeah, I totally agree. All we can do is be leaders, um, upskill our own, uh, what we do, teach it to others who want to learn, and that's all we can do from there. Yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, I was going to ask this, do you think that because of the the lack of regulation and the lack of standards in the industry, for example, it's very tough to, because imagine like if you were a doctor or a lawyer, right, you don't get away with not doing your professional development. Like if you don't meet certain criteria, you don't like, in, for example, in medicine, if you don't do your electives, you don't do the certain things you need to do, you can't hold your license, like your license gets taken off you if you're not continuing to, to develop and study. And I think for me, at least the only way that is the fitness industry is going to be able to regulate you know, those people who, for example, pass the level three and then they're just not interested in spending money because they just want to like charge by there and keep all of themselves. It's almost getting to a point where I know reps have tried to do it and other different bodies have tried to do this, like to kind of keep up with CPD points or whatever else. Um, but I do feel like it's almost going to take a really stringent level of uh, kind of uh, governing, some form of governing body or rules to kind of say, right, well, unless you're a trainer who is doing X number of hours of development and you can have that signed off by a body or whatever else i think it's going to be hard to change it so like you say accepting that's probably not going to change anytime soon we yeah. just have to do exactly what you said just keep uh keep leading from the front yeah. so i'm going to switch gears because one of the questions i had was um can i ask you guys what you feel like you know in, in a one minute summary you specialize in but i think you can actually both cover that earlier so i'm going to ask a different question uh and this relates very specifically to the times we're living in is so obviously you came from Ireland and you moved to Dubai and you know we actually man and I literally had a conversation about this earlier. What do you, what have you seen to be the biggest differences between um, the kind of type of clientele and the way you were coaching in Ireland versus what you've come to experience since you've been here? Like, what's the biggest challenge you've had as a coach with working with the different types of clients here? And I'll start with Amar. I think it's um, adherence to nutrition. I mm. find it very that they find it hard to stick to a meal plan for even a week of the kind of the structure where in Ireland, if you give them something, they do it. They put hundred percent effort behind it and they follow everything very strategically. So I find it could be do for me, what I struggled with the food when I first came out, I had a lot of gut issues from here. Um, from the meat and the veg. So I don't know if that has something to do with it. You find the same. Yeah, just the overall quality of food, but also like the problem is you can sit on your, here in your, your own um, apartment or fill up, make a phone call, yeah. and boom, then you've got um, a takeaway to the door. So like it's, we, we're having more issues with that. For me personally, like when I used to work for body type nutrition, we worked internationally. So I had clients from all over the world, um, different ethnic groups, um, people who did Ramadan fasting, um, Indians who like the certain type of food. So for me, I did not have a lot of um, challenges. I worked with these people anyway in the past before. But yes, I totally agree with Emer. Like we had a, a lot of my clients some of them come up with gut issues and sometimes it's the heat and the food and the bacteria and the food and they think, oh, it's an intolerance and they go and get an intolerance scan, a test, which I think is a scam, yeah. go get an intolerance test. Um, and then it's just basically the fact that people, people brunch too much, they go on the weekends. So we have to, yeah. when, we, when we try and help clients transform, we try and have to integrate lifestyle changes as well. So this is like, we're not just teaching clients, oh, here's how they train, oh, here's how to eat. We have to say, look, this is how you have to incorporate lifestyle changes. What can we do to still make life enjoyable, but still get results? Because at the end of the day, we want to improve people's optimal health, um, not just fat loss, the family and, and going for pull days and sitting yeah. by the beach. Um, so yeah, that's it. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's such good points. And uh, the funny thing is, as well, I think a lot of, um, especially a lot of expat coaches coming to the Middle East would often say, oh, you know, it's the culture here. But that's actually quite a general term because when you say the culture here, it's like, well, are you talking about the, the Arab and the Middle Eastern culture? And they do have their own history and their own belief systems around food and everything else and exercise. But the, the thing you just pointed out, Mark, which is funny, is that I just feel like there's a bit of an expat culture here as yeah. well. Like, for example, people that are coming from Western civilizations, just like we came from, that, and like you said, you take them out of one environment, you put them in another, and, and a lot of things change. Like you said, they become a bit more potentially entitled or they have a lot more luxuries just at their doorstep. For example, the brunching culture absolutely kills people out here. Um, yeah, so it's all of these things. Interesting, so I think it's not just the uh, people who are maybe native or closer to here as far as origin is concerned. I actually think expats coming from like, you know, the US, the UK, Europe, they can very easily, if they're not careful, fall into this trap of um, living the, the Dubai culture lifestyle and, uh, you know, gaining the infamous Dubai stone or two at the same time as well. Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. definitely the biggest challenge I think we found was just the, yes, all of a sudden you have to, your brain has to be so sharp to deal with so many different types of people. Um, yeah. But I think that like you said, Mark, earlier, the lifestyle changes, I think, is and the mindset is the thing you have to unlock first and then get that then gets them into a place where, they are you can almost treat them a bit more like the same clients you had back home um yeah, yeah. so that's uh, definitely a good points there and um, i think as well, i think as well as coaches like we we are there to direct basically and also we have to what makes a good coach uh, the, the, um, the ability to adapt to each and every client and and yeah that's what we have to do no matter if we move to any parts of the world we just have to adapt and quickly um, it's important for us to look in if we deal with a client we're not used to dealing with, look into their cultures, what they do, and educate ourselves before we can move forward. So, yeah, that all comes back to the education part as well. Definitely. Cool. So I'm going to ask one final question before we, uh, we kind of wrap things up. And it's going to just be, you know, I think a lot of coaches have spent, you know, past their initial, what I like to call the honeymoon period of the industry, which is that kind of first three to five years. Um, and... They start moving towards like, well, what do I want from my fitness career? And you know, what, what sort of legacy do I want to leave on the industry? So that is exactly the question and, and the, the statement there is what sort of legacy or what would you what impact would you like to make? Say when we're in our you get to your 50s, 60s, you've kind of moved away from doing as much active coaching. Maybe you're more in a educational or or maybe, you know, fingers crossed, you might be able to retire by that point. Let's see. Uh, what sort of legacy do you want to leave? Emer? For me, um, if I can help every single client, at least with self-confidence with their body image, then that's all that I, I can sleep easy at night when I know that I've helped at least change their mindset. Brilliant. Mark? Yeah, I always went under this with a passion and belief. If I could even help one single human being, then, then I, that's a bonus. Um, so the more people we can impact, in a, in a positive way like Emer said it doesn't like they don't have to have a six pack yeah. the, the whole thing is like a better relationship with food um feeling better about themselves um yeah for me it's just like and, and not just impacting general population clients i really want to have an impact on as we're we're going to do as, as in coaches coming up because i want to help them be in a better place. Some of them just don't know, have no understanding how to get better. Um, and I've done so, so many mistakes throughout the years. I've even made mistakes in Dubai. Sometimes I became complacent. Um, I've actually, now I feel absolutely more driven than ever in my life. And I, I picked the ball back up and I'm not dropping it. Um, so as long as I can help people, a lot of the general population are coaches, to get better or be better, then then that's enough for me. And I'm not retiring anytime soon. <laughs> Very good. Um, so I guess before I get into the, where people can find you and everything else, uh, I think I just want to finish on just commending both of you because from what you know, we've certainly seen, and obviously we've got to know each other better more recently as we've kind of came together. From a distance at least, the thing I'd probably commend the both of you for is it's very clear when you you see your social media and you see the way that the people you've interacted with since you've been in Dubai 
uh, it's very clear that you build very authentic relationships with the clients that you work with, with the people you come across. Uh, and it's very clear that you've inspired a lot of people in the time since you've been here as well. Uh, so I just want to commend you both for, for doing that and showing up and doing that consistently uh, and looking forward to seeing more of that in the coming months, years and post-COVID situation. Yeah, looking forward to this is all over. And um, <laughs> yeah, let's see what, what's going to happen. But all I can see is it being um, even better, more successful. I feel the team we have now is, is fantastic. Um, I couldn't pick any better coaches to be around me. Everybody's driven. Everybody's going to keep improving and self-development, even at the level we were at, we are at. Um, we we have a name for the future, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Big time. So, Emar, where can people find you? Where's the best place to connect with you? Most likely, uh, Instagram. Uh, Emar underscore Louise underscore Morrison. Wonderful, Mark. Yeah. So, like. I use my Instagram for my work mainly, <laughs> mainly apart from the old picture of my French bulldogs. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Mark, Mark underscore Doherty, D-O-H-E-R-T-Y underscore coaching. Um, so that's where I put, I, as I try and put a lot of information on there, specifically more so on um, nutrition. I try and use it as an educational page. Um, I try and use it to show, show people what work I do. I think it's very important for coaches um, to put 90% of their client work on or a high percentage of their client work or their training or what they do instead of just pictures of your abs like through the whole page. It doesn't like People need to see what you can do and what you're skilled at. So in that, then that's why we use Instagram. And not just button ab selfies, right? Nope. Definitely. Awesome, guys. Thanks so much for giving me your time. And uh, of course, we'll have you back on in the future for um, or just a bit of general show and answering different nutrition training uh, and coaching questions as, as they come up. Um, remember, guys, just um, for those that are new listening to this, which pretty much everyone will be at the start, be sure to support us the best you can, whether you're a current client of um, myself, Mark, Emar, or of any of the other coaches on the team. Please go on to Apple once the first show is released. Give us a five-star review. The more support we can get from from you guys the more we can get the more people we can get in front of with the, the information that we're going to share with everyone uh so yeah just go on there five star review even leave us a little comment or any suggestions of things you want to see in the show guess you maybe want us to bring on uh we'd be yeah, very, because, very grateful for that yeah because we could get some big names coming on for definite yeah sure so um no request is too big to ask for guys thanks so much and um we'll hey, see thank you. you good chatting see ya bye